it's the weekend again so more working on the Riley although I think I'm at one of those stages where I'm sitting looking at things a lot and trying to figure things out and working out what I'm doing and procrastinating a bit so the thing I'm looking at at the moment is the the little clamps that hold the guards on so on a Brooklyn's the way the guards are held in place is with three quarter inch diameter tubing at the back and there are three stays on each guard and there are effectively little tubes with a nut and a, a, a set screw that goes into them and the the guard stays go into that tube and it all gets clamped together there are three of those on the back one of them goes here so I guess it'll go it's interesting the, the pictures it looks like it's in the middle of this but it makes more sense if it's above the axle I guess but there's one here that um, it's on a bracket that goes up here and across and down so that gives you one of them uh, there's another one on the front here about here somewhere and then the last one is on this piece of um, timber here and then the tube will sort of have to be bent basically to uh, to attach the guards now these guards I've got on here are actually original Riley guards but these were hacked up sometime in the past you can see how it's been pie sliced and joined back together so the front of them I believe these originally would have been on the, on the original Brooklyn's there were different styles of guards and you saw sort of little short cycle type guards but there were also front guards that went along there and came back straight to down here somewhere uh, similar to how I did on the Austin and I believe these were originally like that so this would have sat sort of there the holes there are for the side light but the the good thing about having these is it, it gives me the exact profile and the little kick on the nose that the original guards had uh, one thing I don't think I'll be able to do is make them with this kind of seam down the edge so you can see the Riley ones have a, a sort of seam where it's it's sort of clamped over I won't really focus on it uh, that would be pretty tricky for me to do I think so I suspect mine will be in one piece or rather multiple pieces all welded together uh, which is which is exactly the same as how I did it on the on the Austin 7 and then it's a simple wired edge so that's how the rear guards work I'm trying to figure out what sort of tubes and things I need so I do have this piece of thick wall galvanized pipe if I can find a thinner pipe that goes into there that's about the right sort of diameter so that would get welded to various brackets like that and then a nut welded on it uh, so you can do up a screw to hold everything in place the front guards are held with two stays one comes off here and up onto the guard and depending on the style of guard if I do the long straight ones there's another bracket down here this is one that came with the pile of parts that I got and this is pretty hefty um, don't think this is original it looks pretty rough but then looking at some of the other stuff on the Brooklyn's they were they could be a bit rough but I'm pretty sure this was made after the fact um, this looks like it would be the sort of bracket that goes probably there something like that I'm not sure so I'll have to remake those when the time comes as well so I've just been looking at lots of pictures and lots of period pictures and things like that to figure out exactly how that works and then today um, oh the reason I need to do all of this because it might not be obvious is I need all of those in place before I do the skin so I'm trying to figure out everything I need to do before I can actually start doing the skinning on the car because once you put the skin on the frame it's not going to come off not easily at least the other thing I need to look at is um, originally I was thinking the petrol tank would go 
I'd reuse those mountings, but it turns out the petrol tank is actually mounted to the chassis. Um, I think it's like a three point mount on the Brooklyn's. So I need to come up with something there. That's pretty easy with the, with the open nature of the cross members, you can easily drill holes and put, um, you know, uh, steel braces or whatever it is you need across there. Uh, the fact that the petrol tank isn't attached to the frame should have been obvious to me when I was watching the the period film I found recently, uh, which is called Death Drives Through, which is set at Brooklyn's in period and actually has a lot of interesting cars in it, including a Riley Brooklyn's like this being raced on a dirt track, but with the back half of the body missing. So all this section of frame is just gone, but you can clearly see the petrol tank on the back there, so it's obviously mounted to the chassis. So I should have realized that sooner. Luckily, a friend of mine pointed that out to me. And speaking of friends of mine, a another friend of mine, Bruce, who's, among other things, a, a, a sculptor, he, he thought it wasn't right me using bent pipe for my starter handle and he offered to make me this piece off a starter handle because he had the material and all the equipment to be able to do that pretty easily. I could do it, I would have to get hold of some steel and it's just tricky getting hold of small amounts of steel. Um, it was a lot easier when I lived in Auckland, I used to know various different places you could go to buy stuff like that, that would be open in the weekend as well. Down here it's a little bit harder, I haven't actually cracked that problem yet. There is a local engineering shop up the road um, I use occasionally, that's where I go and get my welding gas from, and they're a proper um, engineering workshop type thing, they build things for people, and they've got a big skip out the back. So I keep meaning to go and ask them if I can, can rummage through their skip, because you know, pieces of pipe like this, you know, it's, it's worth almost nothing to them. You know, if they're using hundreds of meters of this stuff or lumps of steel or bits and pieces like that but for a hobbyist like me you know a little piece of pipe like this will last me years probably um, you know i just need to make little bits and pieces similarly getting some steel bar stock um, you know so i can make this end piece just little bits and pieces like that otherwise i have to buy uh, lengths of stock but i kind of have to get short lengths which makes it expensive uh, otherwise, you're talking about buying full lengths of things and, you know, they're sort of six meters long and having those delivered and it all starts getting complicated and expensive. I may order some, though, when I start doing the skinning because I am going to have to buy some aluminium and bits and pieces. So it might be worth doing a big order and just getting in a stock of stuff. Um, so Bruce has made up the handle for me and he's even machined in the little groove. We were talking about how you do this little crimp here and I did think about modifying the bead roller somehow to be able to put that in there um, but then uh, Bruce and I both had the same idea which is using a little tube cutter or pipe cutter and I've got a really crappy one of those somewhere that didn't actually ever cut the tube very well I can modify that and if I anneal the brass tubing I should be able to then put this little sort of dimple in there that's that's what keeps the the handle in place um, which is a neat way of doing it but what else today I, I I fixed something that it's been bugging me for ages which is I've never had the choke hooked up on this and um, I did have to buy new choke levers from the SU people these are incredibly expensive uh, but this is the correct setup with the twin SUs like this so I wanted to figure out how to do the choke pull and I'd previously bought the cable and the correct knob. Um, so in period they often called this a strangler. Um, other people would know it of course as the choke and I guess people in modern cars would think of it as a what the hell's that knob for because you don't have them anymore. Uh, I liked this, I got the knob off eBay, I think, so it just seemed a little bit more period correct than a little a little 60s choke symbol. And what I wanted was to get the choke pull as straight as possible, to make it as easy as possible, because often they're quite sticky. So I came up with this, 
and spent most of the morning making this. It's a little bracket that clamps over the top of the steering box. So these bolts clamp the steering box together, so I've reused that. I threaded this side so there's no nut, it just threads in and you can tighten that up nice and, and tight. This is a separate little um, stainless steel piece that the, the cable fits into, um, so that holds it nicely. And then to actually do the pull part, I made up this little clamp. And this is two pieces of steel. Um, I drilled and tapped them and bolted them together and then machined it in the mill to get it all nice and square. And I drilled two holes down the center of it so that when you open the clamp, there's a, a semicircle in each side. And that just then nicely clamps onto the, the bar in the middle. And I got the spacing so that it's a straight pull on the cable. There's no side motion on it whatsoever, which is good. Uh, to make sure it clamps really nicely, there's actually a piece of copper um, either side. So I cut a little piece of copper, punched a hole in the middle, and the copper's nice and soft. So when you clamp this up, you can get it really tight. And the reason I wanted to do it like this is because, you know, normally you have little screw type clamps for these cables and it always mangles the cable. And if you want to adjust the cable, it can get quite tricky because you've ended up crushing it and it's quite hard to move it. So I wanted something that would clamp it over a wider area and not, not destroy it, but still be really nice and, and strong on there. And this works really well. The reason it's up here is because it's a Brooklyn's and the clearance on everything is really tight. So you need to make sure it doesn't interfere with the throttle cable, uh, the throttle lever, which is what, what that is. So that works really well. Um, really do it with one hand because these are always quite hard to to pull um, this has little notches on it so it kind of locks into position and I did try starting the car with the choke out that's the first time I've ever really tried it with the choke working and it fired straight up so that was well worth doing um, pretty sure it's all nicely out of the way nothing's gonna get caught up but it was a good a good thing to get done because that one has actually been been bugging me for a long time and it's a nice straight run for the cable up to wherever it goes on the instrument panel and I think that's it for today as I mentioned these cables need to be you really want them nice and straight for them to work properly uh, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to show this but the cable here, can you see it? Um, there's a flat spot on the top and there's actually a little spring clip in there and notches on the, the control. So it lets you lock the choke into different positions. And this should have three positions. There we go. And you can, uh, and that's the choke fully, fully on and you can lock it you sort of you sort of twist it and it'll pull back in and you can lock it into the next position and this gives me three different levels of choke effectively so whoops um, because you need there's there's quite a bit of travel there so you can see I think that'll work really well. Oh, one other small thing. I found my old tube cutter that completely doesn't work, um, which I think I can modify to make a little tool to do the crimp on the brass starting handle, or the brass sleeve that goes on the starting handle. All I need to do is undo the screw and put a, instead of a cutter in there, a uh, a little washer really and hopefully that should be good enough if I anneal the brass to make it nice and soft to put that little crimp in there and that's what holds the the brass on the handle oh that was one other little thing I did this week I decided a, 
a modern vitamin C container wasn't the best thing for my, my oily rag that I'm using to keep everything from rusting. Um, it's just a rag soaked in WD-40 basically, just a very light oil. So I decided I needed something a bit more period correct as a tin to keep that, that cloth in. And I found this on TradeMe, our local sort of auction site. Uh, it was actually this and about five other little tins, which are all now sort of up there. The Castrol one is a modern one, you, you can buy those. But uh, a couple of other little tins, which of course always look good up on the, the shed wall. But I particularly like this one, because one, it's the perfect size, but two, it says wartime container on it. Um, I don't know what that means exactly, but it kind of puts it in the period. It actually makes the tin older or, or newer than the car. The car is older if the car is a 1930. I'm guessing this was World War II, but it's kind of more in keeping. And you could imagine that, you know, if somebody did have a rag that they were keeping in the car that was now getting a bit older and needed wiping down a lot, that would be the right sort of period tin for it. So I thought that was a nice little find and I'll keep that in the car. There's the modern microfiber cloth, of course. Uh, so maybe I should change that for something cotton, but you don't want to go too mad with the details. I thought that was a nice little thing. It was pretty cheap too. I think it was about $20 for all of them. This is my, my little helper, aren't you Milo? Yeah, helping me put the MG away. Good chat. So, no actual progress on the Riley today. Uh, I think the only thing I did is bought some three-quarter tubing, uh, just to get an idea of the size. I think for the guard stays, I'd like to use thicker wall tubing. But this is just for me to um, play with and see how I can make all of that work. It doesn't fit very nicely inside the thicker wall pipe. It's too loose. Um, so I'll have to come up with something else there. Um, my friend Bruce is helping me with some of that as well. He's got bits of metal and different bits and pieces and has a few ideas. So we'll see what we can come up with. Uh, as I mentioned, I basically spent the day cleaning cars, um, cleaned and washed the MG, gave the Landy a good clean. I sort of wet sanded on the bonnet where the clear coat was coming off just to get rid of the really flaky stuff. And I haven't properly fixed it yet, but I gave it a really good coat of wax, uh, which I hope will slow it down a little bit until I'm ready to actually try and fix it properly. Uh, the other thing I did is because I was out this morning, I bought more gearbox oil for the KT250. Um, I'm using Penrite oil. This stuff here, I already had a bottle, uh, but they're one litre bottles and the bike needs 1.2 litres. So um, I had to go get another one. So I drained the old oil out, which was pretty dirty, but there were no bits of metal or anything in it, so that was good and refilled it and I also bought some high temperature RTV to do the joint between the the two halves of the exhaust system um, so that should all set up nicely and I decided it was time to actually start doing something with the wheels I've been agonizing over what to do with these for a while originally I was thinking I could paint them but that would look kind of crappy I think um, plus you've got steel and aluminium here. Uh, I did also think about just replacing all the spokes, which is doable, but that works out to be quite expensive and I don't want to spend that much money on this at the moment. So in the end, I just went for cleaning them up as best I can. I got a lot of the rust off them, uh, all the loose rust anyway, and none of the spokes are broken. Uh, they all seem tight. So... I found this old tin of Canuba wax uh, car polish 
and all I've really been doing is rubbing everything down with that just giving it a really good coat of the wax and I think that'll be fine uh, it'll be perfectly usable like that it might be not be perfectly pretty but they came up all right so the next thing will be fitting the tires and I suddenly realized I don't know how to do that I, I've got a vague idea because I've done it on cars before but I thought I should look up the proper way of doing it and how things like the, these bead locks and uh, rim bands and bits and pieces work. So these go under the bands apparently. Um, and I ordered a set of nice long levers. I've got some old, proper vintage old, well 50s old, um, car tire ones, but they're not in great shape. So I thought, okay, I'll invest in a set of decent tire levers. So I've got a couple of them coming. And I found some good um, information online about how you get the tires fitted using the levers. So once they arrive, I think I'll just re refit the tires and I'll just use the wheels as they are for now. Um, one interesting thing is the lubricant. Um, I didn't get the tire lubricant. You can buy special lubricant for fitting the tires, but anything I bought from the place I bought the tire irons from, they're, they're, because they're posting it, they were going to charge me an extra 10 or $20, I think it was, for dangerous goods shipping. Um, so I didn't want to pay, pay as much again as the lube was. Uh, a lot of people just use dish soap, dish, dish soap and water. Um, apparently that can cause problems because it's slightly alkaline and it'll eventually rust the, the aluminium. Um, I decided what I will use is the, uh, if I can find it, I'll just use some of the silicone grease, um, which is what I've been using on the rubber hoses on the Riley after somebody suggested it, or a couple of people suggested it. Uh, and that works well and is designed for rubber and it doesn't... Um, attack the metals, it won't attack the aluminium or anything like that. It's nice and slippery. Uh, worked really well on the hoses on the Riley that made it just dead simple to fit those. So I think a little smear of that all the way around should work pretty well for the tires. And I have measured the voltage on the, the wires. Uh, I'm not getting voltage for the lights. So there's obviously voltage being generated because the horn kind of works and the ignition definitely works. Uh, I think there might be different windings inside there for different things. And I haven't actually opened that up to have a look. So maybe that's the next thing I have to do is do that to figure out why there are, there's, there's no power to the lights. Um, I guess the only other thing it could be is the little regulator box, but that's a, a completely sealed unit. So I can't imagine that would be a problem. Uh, the only other thing I'll need to do is fill up the front forks with fluid, but I'm waiting until I've got it on its wheels for that. Uh, there is a measurement. I can't remember how much it is uh, in the manual. It does tell you exactly how much to put in there. So maybe I'll get a um, like a disposable syringe or something, because it's not much. Um, you know, and use that to fill these up. So that's where we're at for the weekend.